Hello, my name is Donnell Guignard. This channel is called The Defendant. I'm the creator of this channel. For the record, I am a paralegal. At this time, I want to give a message to the people that run the following YouTube stations. One, the NU. Two, Harlem Legend TV. Three, Geezy Hip Hop Central. And four, end of sentence. In short, after reviewing you guys' content on the Mean Hearst case, I have reached the conclusion that you guys' content on this case is violating Mr. Hearst's right to the presumption of innocence. To be sure, after reviewing you guys' content, it's clear that neither of you guys or y'all followers could be a juror in Mr. Hearst's case. Another way put, neither of you guys or any of your followers could provide Mr. Hearst with a fair trial. Also, I would like to say that after watching you guys' channel, it's clear that you guys have absolutely no respect for the rights of the accused. Do you know that the presumption of innocence is a fundamental idea in trial law that helps our legal system to remain fair? The presumption of innocence means that anyone accused of a crime is assumed to be innocent until they have been proven guilty. True story. After reviewing you guys' channel, it looked like all of you have assumed that Mr. Hearst is guilty. I bet that all of you guys believe that everyone who is accused of a crime is guilty too. In closing, today I'm fighting for accused person's right to the presumption of innocence. And since we are on the record, I'm going to give you my reasons for why I feel the presumption of innocence is considered good for us and worth fighting to maintain. First... It is good because people lie, people give false evidence, and people do all things in between. They may do this in the course of attempting to prove guilt or innocence. This is a fact of human nature, and this is why a person charged with an offense is presumed innocent, not a saint. Second, it is good because the presumption of innocence presumes the best of us and not the worst. It places humans on a high plane and thereby facilitates where appropriate a plea of guilty. This is important in the administration of justice and with us feeling right with the system of justice. In sum, I believe that my reasons for fighting for the presumption of innocence are valid and if you believe the same thing that I do, you guys should agree that YouTube channels, the media, should have a major role in protecting this right. At the end of the day, I understand that you guys' media channels are driven by the desire to reach and keep larger audiences and are pressured by the competition of new communication channels such as social networks and video sharing platforms. However, you guys can't be tempted to ignore the fundamental rights of suspects and accused persons and publish information that would affect the presumption of their innocence. Do you guys understand that the potential impact of a violation of the presumption of innocence is not limited to those directly involved in the proceedings? Inappropriate disclosure of information can affect the accused person's life in many ways and his or her families. Do you understand that you guys' content can cause someone to lose their job, become isolated from the community and family and for their reputation to be damaged in society? True story, I really hope that Mr. Hurst gets acquitted and he and his family sue you and obtain compensation. Okay, it's time for me to go. Thanks to everybody for watching this video. If you wish to learn about more information on presumption of innocence, please stay tuned. Thank you. But we begin with uh, a brief discussion about the origins of presumption of innocence, which is considered to be a very important part of our criminal justice system. And our criminal justice system was borrowed from the English common law. So it might surprise you to find out that the presumption of innocence is not found and was not originally found in English common law. It was borrowed from the French Roman law and adopted into English common law near the end of the 12th century. And it was adopted by reform-minded jurists who were trying to move away from the proof practice of that era and it involved what was called an, a test or an ordeal of proof. Ordeal of proof was like a medieval way of proving guilt or innocence. It required you to subject yourself to these tests. 
For example, there was a hot, a boiling hot water test where an accused was required to stick their hand into a boil, to boiling water and to retrieve a stone. And after the stone was retrieved, the injured hand was wrapped. And after three days, they would unwrap the hand to see if it was, it was healing or blistering. If it was blistering, you were guilty. <laughs> and if it was healing, you were innocent. So that is how uh, people prove their innocence under English common law in the 12th century. So these reform-minded jurists decided we want to move away from that. We want to incorporate Roman law, which involved a process of proof that didn't include these types of torturous, horrible practices. But these practices were, in, were had been embraced by the people, by the church, by, by the rulers, and they knew that it would be difficult, it wouldn't be easy to make people switch, to move away from these sort of pagan rituals and practices. And so they came up with a wonderful way to come, come up with a compelling argument to move towards this Roman law. They looked at some of the principles that were contained in Roman law, including the presumption of innocence, and said that this was not just a product of uh, community norms, like most common law, but it really came from God. This was, these were divine principles found in the Bible. And they said the presumption of innocence came from the, the book of Genesis. And it began when God said to Adam, after he found out he had eaten from the, the tree of life, um, and he confronted him. He asked him, even though he's omnipotent, what did you do? And Adam was given an opportunity to explain himself. And so these reform-minded jurists said, this presumption of innocence that God gave to Adam is something that everyone, all people, should be entitled to. And so they said the Roman law and these principles, including the presumption of innocence, was divine law. And over time, they managed to convince people, including the church and rulers, that not only did this apply to common people, but it applied to rulers and powerful people. Everyone had to submit to this concept of presumption of innocence. So if you flash forward a couple centuries, <laughs> we end up having this same presumption um, which you know, transferred from Europe to America through the colonies and ultimately it was recognized as being an integral part of our system in 1894 in a case called Coffin v. U.S. where we embraced this idea of presumption of innocence being an integral part of the Anglo-American Anglo jurisprudence. The presumption of innocence, the defendant is presumed innocent. That's the starting point. He's presumed innocent of these charges and this presumption remains with him throughout the course of the trial, the presentation of the evidence, throughout the course of your deliberations, until and unless the state has proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant does not have to prove his innocence. We talked about this in jury selection. We talked about the starting point. The defendant doesn't have to try to catch up he starts at the presumption of innocence. The presumption of innocence is something that exists here in our courts, in our state, and in our country. It is not something you can see or touch, but it is something you can feel. It's like a blanket that wraps around you when you're charged with a crime. And it doesn't come off until the end of your trial if the state proves the charges against you beyond a reasonable doubt. Now the purpose of the presumption of innocence is to protect you from being charged unfairly or unfairly punished for something that the state cannot prove that you did.